Good morning, brothers, brothers, just brothers. Let's go to our Father in prayer. Father, thank you for uh, the morning. Thank you for the sunrise. It is absolutely spectacular. And for many of us getting to see all those dolphins uh, just perusing through uh, is just showing us uh, your beauty, your might, your majesty, and just how doggone magnificent you are. And we, uh, we stand in awe that you've chosen us. Uh, to be your children, not only to be your children, Father, but to uh, be your mouthpiece for the message, such a glorious message, the greatest message ever told of Jesus Christ. You've entrusted that to us. And Father, we beg of you every day to continue to lift our eyes to you, our heart and our mind, our soul, enable our faith to increase, enable us to overcome the obstacles that Satan puts before us, that try to thwart us from seeing you, thwart us from having the vision, thwart us from maintaining uh, the same heart that Jesus had, a heart of compassion for the lost and those that are suffering. Enable us, your servants, to do your will. Let your spirit be with us this morning in this class, not only this, but throughout all the classes that are being taught. God, you are magnificent in every way. We love you and we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You know, today I want to talk about, you know, just a a, a personal vision. Your own personal vision. Your own drive uh, to do something great for God. Um, I've been a Christian since 1986. I was baptized in October. I think it was Halloween weekend. Uh, Not too sure. Uh, I went to church that Sunday, got baptized that afternoon, Uh, and I woke up going, what in the world have I gotten myself into, and uh, never left. Um, Have had the the privilege and the honor to be around so many great men and women that have helped to shape me, to um, mature me. Correct, rebuke, challenge, to uplift, to encourage, and uh, so many people. Uh, I stand up here uh, on their shoulders as I share uh, some of my convictions with you uh, this morning. Uh, these are not things that uh, I, I went to Oxford or Yale or Harvard uh, to study, but I studied these in the the study halls of life and. <laughs> There are a lot of people that help me along the way. And my prayer for you this morning is that you'll find something of substance from here that I hope will change your life too as it has changed mine. Uh, I got this statement here. Anyone can uh, overindulge in multitasking, but the courageous indulge in self-control and daily improvement. Uh, You know, the bottom line is if we get focused... uh, The sky is the limit. God will enable us through his Holy Spirit to really accomplish pretty much anything that's uh, within his will. But the real issue is being courageous enough to indulge in a life of self-control and daily improvement. That we are intentional in what we do. And if you want to rise up and do something great, uh, you have to have a vision. When that vision is, is before you, you have to be intentional And you have to be willing uh, to exercise a great measure of self-control on a daily basis. And in doing so, you can accomplish just about anything. God has given you his Holy Spirit. He has entrusted himself unto you and in your body to do great things for God. This is a early 1990 Honda Civic. I think it's between 90 and... Maybe 93, 94 Honda Civic. Uh, It's a classic vehicle. If you have one of those right now, it's probably still running. Uh, When I was in college, I went to the University of Massachusetts. Uh, Yes, UMass. Uh, And um, when I graduated, I studied the Bible with a ton of people. And I studied the Bible with this one gentleman who was not a college student. He was a single man. Lived in South Jersey, but he decided to move up to Massachusetts because at that time there wasn't a church uh, in, the, in Philadelphia nor South Jersey. And uh, so he moved up and he, was, he worked in a, a small apartment complex and he was a janitor, you know, probably making $10, $12 an hour, not much at all. 
And after a couple of years there, he decided to buy this Honda Civic, literally the same one. It was red. Red was his favorite color. And uh, he bought that car and he kept that car until maybe, I would say maybe five, six years ago. And I remember seeing that car and it had well over 300,000 miles on it. This red Honda Civic. And I was like, dude, like, you know, you can get a new car. You're married, you got kids. He goes, he says, what? I said, yeah, I'd get rid of that car, man. You take it down, push your toe, and they'll give you a thousand bucks on a trade-in or something. He goes, you know how much that car is worth? And I go, nothing. <laughs> and he looked at me, he said, you know, because I said to Bob, he says, Chip, you know, when I bought that car, I said, I remember when you bought that car, it was brand new. He said, look at it now. And he goes, that car still runs. I said, fine. He said, Chip, when I bought that car, I had a monthly payment that was about $190 a month, $180, $190 a month. He said, so every month I paid that car payment until the car was paid off. He said, in like four years. And he said, but when it was paid off, what I decided to do was take that $180, $190 and keep paying for the car. I go, why would you keep paying for the car? He goes, no, I paid myself. So I set up a savings account and every month, I put 180, 180, 100. He says, after the first year, I got to almost two grand with a little bit of interest. He said, after the second year, I got another two grand with a little more, a little bit more interest. He said, the third year, I did the same, I did the same. He said, he said I remember the day that account got to over $70,000. I said, what? He goes, yeah, I remember that day. I was like, dude, are you kidding me? He goes, that car is worth a lot of money to me right now. <laughs> I saw him uh, maybe two years ago. Maybe. I don't even think it was two years ago. His mom passed away. And so I went to the funeral, and uh, I saw him. I said, hey, man, you know what? I, I always tell that story of that, that Honda Civic you had, you know, and you kept paying yourself. And how you remember when it got over 70 or something like that? He goes, you still tell that story? I said, absolutely. He goes, the account's over 100000 now. I said, dude, you're killing me. <laughs> he finally did get rid of the car, though, because he took it to the mechanic. The mechanic said, dude, I can't fix this anymore. <laughs> so he got another car. He has a Subaru now, and I'm sure he's going to do the same. But exercising some self-discipline, boy, that'll, that'll change your life. How many of us could use a hundred grand right now just for nothing? <laughs> a little bit of self-discipline. And it can change everything. You know, and it's all about having a personal vision. You know, your personal vision is how you commit to living your life. You know, it's a clear personal vision. A clear personal vision is an integration of your abilities, interests, personalities, values, goals, skills, experience, family of origin, the stage of adult development. If you have a personal vision, you will have a guide for decisions. Become meaning, you know, meaning driven and interdirected. In other words, that you have an internal uh, clock or compass that directs you. You will think in a long term and maintain balance in your life. This is what a personal vision will give you if you're willing to exercise some self-discipline. Without vision, the people will perish. You know, you can go through life with so many gifts, so many talents, so many opportunities, but if you don't have a clear vision, you're meandering around in life in a desert that will end not reaching any of your real heartfelt ambitions and dreams. You know, my father uh, was an amazing man. Uh, he, he absolutely was my hero uh, and still is to this day. Uh, my father conquered many things, many adversities, many challenges. My father had a third grade education. Couldn't read to save his life. <laughs> After he passed away, I was looking at his journal. 
his writing, let's just say a first grader would have done much better. <laughs> but he still wrote. Uh, but man, he was, he was an amazing man in work ethic and taking care of his family and, and uh, doing many things. And I remember when my father passed away. At the end of his life, my father had spent five, five and a half years in prison uh, and things kind of fell apart. And then he died. And I remember I, I was going through his clothes and he had $167 in his, in his pants pocket. And that was it. You know, and I, and, I, and I always thought, wow, I know that wasn't my dad's ambition for his life. Somewhere along the line, he lost track of his own vision and what he wanted to accomplish. And, and for him, it wasn't the same vision that I have for my life. But I know he did not accomplish what he dreamed of. And, and I know that it, it, it boils down to his inability to exercise the discipline that was necessary to accomplish what you dream of. And Raising up, rising up within God's kingdom is going to take some intentionality on all of our parts. You, you just can't hope for it, pray for it, fast for it, and do nothing to see it accomplished. Studies consistently show that this is the one factor. Personal vision is more important in both success and a satisfaction in life than any other factor. Your personal vision is more important than your intelligence, your socioeconomic background, and your education. That my buddy that owns that, or used to own that Honda Civic, he's probably, his net worth is probably well over half a million dollars. Here's a gentleman that had a very difficult time reading, never made more than $60,000 a year in his life, his home, his home, well, he had multiple homes. They were all paid off and never made a lot of money. But he exercised discipline towards his vision of where he wanted to be financially. And now he's at my age, 50, he's probably, I think he's a year older, 53, no, 54, actually, today. And he said, now he's like, well, what do, what do you want to do with your life? He says, I got no debt, I, everything, I own everything. In, in, in my life, you know, my kids' college is all taken care of. What I want to do is, you know, I want to get a lawnmower business and kind of just go around taking care of single moms and serving, serving the church. Like, that, that's kind of his mindset. Because he had a vision. And now at 54, he's, he's come into fruition for that dream, for what he believed. Why? He exercised the daily discipline necessary to accomplish his vision. If we have a vision, we have to be willing, you and I both, to exercise the daily discipline necessary to accomplish that, vi that vision. You know, today, I want to look at Elijah. You know, here's a guy, you know, your classic uh, symbol of a guy catching a vision and going after it and doing something to rise up for God. To become a workman for God's vision, which became his personal vision. He, like many of you today, have secular jobs and desire to do something great for God. Um, you know, when I, was, when I came out of college, I wanted to go into ministry. And uh, they told me no. Uh, I'll get to that later. <laughs> <laughs> And so I went out and worked in the secular community. And, and so I kept trying to figure out how is it then can I get in the ministry and be self-supporting? And I went into sales and marketing, was very successful, but the success took an enormous amount of hours in the workforce to be that successful. So I couldn't stop working and be self-supporting from it. So I decided, well, I got to find some type of business opportunity to, to enable me to have a business that will make me self-supporting. And at that time, all I wanted was if I can just find a business that paid me $600 a week, I can make it on that because I've got no debt, no school debt, nothing. I had a credit card. I think I had 600 bucks on it at the time. That was it. I mean, I, and I was like, I, I, if I find that, I'll be good to go. And, and I kept trying to find one and all kinds of ideas. And then I got this one 
a business proposal from a company and they wanted me to come down, do training. They said, you know, you come down, you do this. The first year, you, you're going to have to work 40 hours at this business. You're going to have to. But after that, you can open up another one and then another one and another one. And, and this will work. And I'm like, well, yeah, well, how much? How much money do you want? And they said, well, it's 30 grand to get into the franchise. You get into it for 30 grand and we'll get you going. And I'm like, uh, you know, you sound like one of those Christians in the fellowship that has some harebrained idea. And you're going to take my money. And, and I'm like, I don't know, you know. And I'm going back and forth. And I'm like, you know, I could do this. Maybe, maybe not. And, and I said, no, I'm not going to do it. So I turned down Subway. Um, yeah, because I was so smart. <laughs> I happened to be on a cruise several years ago with my wife, and I met a guy, we were just talking. I said, what do you do? He says, oh, I own a, a, a bunch of Subways. I said, you do? And I, and I told him my story. I said, here's what they pitched to me back in 1989, 90. He goes, I said, they said that in, in 10 years, I'd have about 10 or 12 to 14 stores. He goes, yeah, that's exactly what I did. I go, doggone it. <laughs> Shucks. <laughs> I said, really? They really? He goes, yes, it happened exactly that way. Said, That's fine. I'm in the ministry now anyway. Who needs a ham sandwich? Get the cholesterol up. <laughs> so don't ask me about business advice. Because I don't know what I'm talking about. Um, but I was trying to find a way to serve God from my vision point, my vision point was I felt like the ministry was what God wanted me to do. That doesn't mean that that's yours. Yours may be something totally different, but I found myself trying to figure out, and I bet Elisha was the same way. Because as he's plowing, he, soon as Elijah came, he immediately, it had to have been on his heart trying to find a greater purpose. We'll look at his relationship, Elisha's with Elijah, and hopefully gain some insight. Because all of us need to find men that will inspire us. We have to get a team together of men with many different backgrounds, different than you, that have different perspectives. You need different ages and stages of life. Because these men... I believe God will use to spark a vision, a dream, a passion, and will also use them to transform you into whom God wants you to be. And we have to find that. We have to be willing to understand, I need discipleship. I need mentorship. I need men in my life that are different than who I am. That in many cases will make me even feel uncomfortable so that I can be transformed into someone much better than I am left on my own. But the thing we've got to understand with all of our visions is that if God has not called you to it, I don't care how hard you work at it, it's just not going to happen. You will be the fly on the window trying to get on the outside. That fly will die trying. It's impossible for the fly to get out unless someone opens the door. God has to open the door. Remember that. No man ever called himself to be a prophet in the scriptures. It was all, and it, all, it has always been God who calls a man to be a prophet. Jeremiah is a prime example as God spoke to him. Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before we were formed, God knew us. And God had a plan for us. And before you were born, he says, I consecrated you. I appointed you a prophet to the nations. Jeremiah 1.5. The very same thing happened with Aaron. When God said to Moses, see, I have made you. God said, I have made you like a God to Pharaoh. And your brother Aaron shall be your prophet. Exodus 7.1. There are similar callings of Isaiah. We see that. We see that with Ezekiel, Elisha. We see that with all the prophets. We even see it with John the Baptist, the last of the Old Testament prophets. The Bible says he was set aside at birth for this purpose. Matthew 11, verse 13. You know, God has to call you. 
to whatever that vision is. We have to be surrendered to God's vision over our own. When I went to college, I went on a full athletic scholarship to the University of Massachusetts to be a running back. I had dreams of, you know, 2,000 yard seasons. Uh, I got there and redshirted because I had an injury, and got myself back together, and then me and another brother were fighting for the same position to play tailback. And he was a disciple, I was a disciple, and I'm discipling him. <laughs> and we're fighting for the same position. One of our discipleship times, he said, I got to confess. I go, what, do you, what, do you, what? Like, what's going on? You know, what are you struggling with? He goes, well, when you were running the ball the other day in the game, I was praying you get hit and get hurt. <laughs> it's like, I don't know how to take that, right? Like, I mean, why didn't he just pray that I'm not successful? He said, hurt. Like, <laughs> that I'm injured. Are you serious? Like, wow. Like, what am I supposed to do with that? He said, he said, well, I, I pray for an injury, not a real bad one, but enough <laughs> to kind of get you out the way. <laughs> it's terrible. <laughs> I was like, I didn't know what to say. I can't even remember what I said. Amen. And so he, so I wind up actually beating him out and I became the starting tailback. He was not happy. We had to wrestle through it all. Uh, my other roommate was the one that kind of shepherded us and took care of us. He was much bigger than us, so that worked. <laughs> but then I had a problem. Like, I could run really well, but I kept dropping the ball. Ooh. And this is not rugby. <laughs> and one particular game against the University of Connecticut, I fumbled the ball four times. Four times. Like, it was so bad that the fourth time... The Yukon defender helped me up off the ground. Looked at me and said, man, you're just having a bad day. I mean, like, the opponent team felt bad. He's like, man, I'm just sorry. Like, I felt like he was about to hug me and say, now get on over there and sit down because you ain't going to never play again. I mean, it was misery. It was so... I was like, and, I, and then you got to get on that daggone phone. Well, now they got headsets. Well, back then we had phones because the coach up there, and I'm like, he is going to cuss me out. Like, I might die after he finishes. <laughs> and he just, and the coach was, he, again, everyone felt so bad. They go, hey, you okay? I'm like, <laughs> I'm like, no. <laughs> He's like, look, I, I got to sit you down. I was like, okay. And that was it. I didn't see the field again. And after so many games, I just went to coach's office and I said, hey, coach, um, it's obvious I'm never going to play here again. Uh, can you move me, move my position, move me to wide receiver, which if you're an athlete, you never relinquish your position. You never surrender. But I was a Christian and I realized that humility has some substance. <laughs> and I just said, just move me to wide receiver. He's like, wide receiver? I go, yeah, I'll lose weight. I'll go and play wide receiver. I went on to break pretty much all the records at UMass as a wide receiver. I did I finished the all-time uh, leading receiver. I, I, I have more all-purpose yards than Victor Cruz. Yes, I have 3,200. He's not even on the chart, just for the record. <laughs> just for the record. Now, he, did, he does have a Super Bowl ring, but I have a Dallas Cowboys Super Bowl ring. It's not a real Dallas Cowboys Super Bowl ring, but it is a Super Bowl ring, and I wear it with great pride. If anyone in Philly will tell you that. But I had to surrender to, this is the role God wanted me to play on the team. You, sometimes you got to surrender to what God's vision is. But let's pick up and read 1 Kings 19. Beginning in verse 19, it says, So Elijah went... From there and found Elisha, son of uh, Shaphith. He was plowing with 12 yoke of oxen, and he himself was driving the 12th pair. Elijah went up to him and threw his cloak around him. Elijah then left his oxen and ran after Elijah. Let me kiss my father and mother goodbye, he said, and then I will come with you. Go back, Elijah replied. What have I done to you? He has lit a fire, and Elijah, oh boy, this dude is in trouble. What have I done to you? 
So Elijah left him and went back. He took his yoke of oxen and slaughtered them. He burned the plow equipment uh, um, to cook the meat and gave it to the people. And they ate. Then he set out to follow Elijah and became his servant. Second Kings chapter 2. After 10 years of mentorship with Elijah. We get to 2 Kings chapter 2 verse 1. When the Lord was about to take Elijah up to heaven in a whirlwind, Elijah and Elisha were on their way to Gilgal. Elijah said to Elisha, stay here. The Lord has sent me to Bethel. But Elisha said, as surely as the Lord lives, as you live, I will not leave you. So they went down to Bethel. The company of the prophets at Bethel came out to Elisha and asked, do you know that the Lord is going to take your master from you today? You're in trouble, dude. Yes, I know, Elisha replied. So be quiet. <laughs> then Elisha said to him, stay here, Elisha. The Lord has sent me to Jericho. He replied, as surely as the Lord lives. As you live, I will not leave you. So they went to Jericho. The company of prophets of Jericho went up to Elijah and asked him, do you know that the Lord is going to take your master from you today? Yes, I know, he replied. So be quiet. Then Elisha said to him, Stay here, the Lord has sent me to Jordan. And he replied, as sure as the Lord lives, as you know, I will not leave you. So the two of them walked on. Fifty men from the company of the prophets went out and stood at a distance facing the place where Elijah and Elisha had stopped at the Jordan. Elisha took out his cloak, rolled it up, struck the water with it. The water divided to the right and to the left. And the two of them crossed over on dry ground. When they had crossed, Elisha said to Elisha, tell me, what can I do for you before I am taken from you? Let me inherit a double portion of your spirit, Elisha replied. You have asked a difficult thing, Elisha said. Yet, if you see me when I'm taken from you, it will be yours. Otherwise, it will not. As they were walking along and talking together, suddenly a chariot of fire and horses of fire appeared and separated the two of them. And Elisha went up to heaven in a whirlwind. Elisha saw this and cried out, My father, my father, the chariots, the horsemen of Israel. And Elisha saw him no more. Then he took hold of his garment and tore it into two. Elisha then picked up Elisha's cloak that had fallen from him and went back and stood at the bank of the Jordan. He took the cloak that had fallen from Elisha, struck the water with it. Where now is the Lord, the God of Elisha, he asked. And when he struck the water, it divided it to the right and to the left. And he crossed over from one man to another. You know, the bottom line is God uses our relationships to train, to discipline, to encourage, to uphold, to strengthen, to help, to build us up, to do a better job of accomplishing God's will. We have to be willing to receive the baton and pass that baton off in many different areas of our life. You know, this, this was amazing that Elisha was like, I'm not leaving this guy. This is my friend. This is my mentor. This is the guy who's really helped me. They were both similar and very different. They were similar in that they both were appointed by God to lead other men, other prophets. They were very similar. Both uh, uh, evidently trained the prophets. We see this company of prophets in different areas. And they both trained these prophets. They both had great power, extraordinary ways that they did God's miracles, which were really amazing. Miracles of judgment uh, towards apostasy and miracles of restoration of faithfulness for Elisha. Both were very unusual in their departure. I mean, to go up in a chariot of horses and fire, I don't know what that was. Maybe it was a UFO. I don't know, but it was pretty awesome. And then Elisha dies and somebody throws a dead corpse on his bones and the dead corpse jumps up. These were two really powerful dudes, but they were very different. Social, uh, social economics. Elijah was pretty much poor. Elisha came from a wealthy background. That's very different. You know, when you look at those in our culture that come from a poor community and those that come from a wealthy community, they don't see the world the same at all. 
But these two guys, best friends. One from a wealthy community, one from a poor community. That says a lot. You look in our society, typically the political views from a poor community and a wealthy community, totally different. But imagine them being best friends. This, this, this relationship, was their personalities were very different. Elijah was a bit emotional. Let me die. You know, you know it's like, I'm, I'm done, man. Put me in a cave and I, I, I'm done. After he didn't kill all these mighty warriors, a woman shows up. He's like, I'm done. I'm going here. He was emotional. Elijah, that's not the case. We don't see that with Elijah. Physically in their appearance, Elijah was hairy. Elisha, he was bald. I prefer bald. Yeah. <laughs> we choose this look, right, brothers? Brothers forever, man. Stay together. Let's stay together. We're going to ride this ship out, baby. Because the rest of them, they just trying to hold on. We choose our destiny. We hang in there. We don't wear hats. We let it ride. Put a little wax up there sometimes so it can shine. Don't smack no bald head guy on the head. That is unethical. As that will get you attacked by a group of bears like Elisha. Or one bear and a group of kids. So don't do that. It ain't funny. The bottom line is different strokes for different folks. But God maybe puts you with a mentor that's different than you are. And sometimes you can kind of go, man... We're so different. No, God has a vision. And God's going to use diversity in relationships to accomplish that many, many times. You've got to find someone to inspire you. But when you find them, they may be very different than you. They may have a different calling than you. Where they give and invest themselves may be somewhere totally different that you will give and invest yourself. But the commonalities in the heart and faith that they invest themselves in, you can take those and invest it in what God has placed on your heart. And we see that with Elijah and Elijah. On the one hand, Elisha's ministry somewhat superseded Elijah's in certain ways. The biblical narrative also records that Elisha had twice as many miracles as Elijah. Elisha had 14. Elijah had seven that are recorded. On the other hand, Elisha's, Elijah's ministry was clearly more dominant in many ways. You know, uh, Elijah was truly larger than life figure. You know, his ministry, he dealt with kings and apostasy. That's where he spent most of his time and his energy. But Elisha... His miracles were more on compassion. You know, by contrast, Elisha's miracles were modest and his deeds of compassion. He cleansed the water in Jericho. He increased the widow's supply of oil. He saved the child from being sold into slavery. He cleansed the plot of food that had been poisoned mistakenly. He fed a hundred men, multiplying a small amount of uh, bread. He cured the Gentile of leprosy. He recovered a lost axe from the head uh, 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 for a man that would have ruined him financially. They were both very different in where they ministered and how they ministered. But the commonality, the common thread in them was pretty simple. Number one, they had a spirit of faith. Now, if we're going to accomplish anything, we have to have a spirit of faith. You know, it's your vision, your personal vision about who you are and who you want to become. Does faith drive it? Now, what I mean by that is that when you think of your vision of who you want to be, does it, is it accomplished because you see the necessary steps to get there? Or is there an element of God is going to have to move to get me there? You see, that's faith. Well, what is faith all about? It's trust. You played the game of trust. If I played it with my friends, they'd let me fall. They found that funny. That's not the point of the game. The point of the game is to build trust. My friends, no, it's to build memories of laughter, watching you fall and be hurt. Oh, look, he's bleeding. Oh, that's so funny. Ah! 
He doesn't remember it. You know, that, that's not the way the game works. But a spirit of faith. I love this image because there's two people. We need more than one person in our life to encourage faith. Amen. You know, you need somebody to push you outside of where you're comfortable. That usually doesn't come from inside. There are very few people that can do that on, them, on their own. You need somebody from the outside that has a different perspective that will challenge your status quo of faith. Where you're comfortable and push you beyond what you believe you can do. How do you know you're living in a spirit of faith? Here, here's, here's a vision. We must live each day as though we had all the power and influence necessary to make it a perfect world. Imagine waking up and in your mind, you understood that you have all the power and influence necessary to make the world perfect. Wow. Now that's faith. You wake up understanding or believing that. That's going to drive every decision you make. That's going to authenticate the choices you make. That's going to give you reason to pray. Reasons to trust God. Reasons to go. Reasons to ask for things that you would never ask for. Why? Because you believe you possess the power and the influence to make this world perfect. If you don't live like that, then what does that mean? It's not that you're sinful, but that you would go, no, oh, that can't happen because of this, or that can't happen because of that, or I can't do that because of this, or I can't do that because of this or that. And so you live in this world without faith. That's more discouraging. Instead of living in a world where you believe nothing is impossible. You know, <laughs> I live in Philly now, and Pat and Bob Gimple are there. And preaching in front of Pat and Bob Gimple about what God's going to do is a little awkward at times. Because I haven't dreamed of anything that hasn't already been done. Like I'm, I'm struggling to find faith in that. But whenever you talk to Pat or Bob about anything, it becomes a worldwide movement. So, oh, Pat, I met this guy over here. He's, you know, he, he's from India. And, you know, he's a pretty cool guy. He's interested in coming to church. <gasps> he's interested in coming to church? I said, yeah, you know, great. Pat would say, hey, I tell you what, let's get him out. Let's get him to go on a brigade to India. We'll fly him out next year. We'll get him to meet all the different. I'm like, wait, wait, they're just interested in coming to church. No, no, I'm telling you, we do this. They'll see India, they'll see the work and they will see God. I'm like, I just want them to come to church. I... <laughs> but they have such a huge expectation of influence, of change, of trying to see God do something. They live in this unbelievable space of faith. We got to dream beyond what we see today. You know, I will seek new resources for learning and growth so that I can live in that mindset that I possess all power and influence to change the world that I'm in. Therefore, I'm going to I'm going to read everything I can get my hands on. I'm going to study everything I can. I'm going to look to better myself so that God can make it clear about where he wants me to go. Faith to go beyond what is comfortable, what is rational in some cases, physically, really challenge myself. Faith is a big step. There was a brother many years ago that I uh, knew in the church, and he got an inheritance. And it was about, I don't know, thirty, thirty-five thousand dollars $35,000. And... Uh, you know, he was working a part-time job, and he's like, wow, man, this is, you know, God has blessed me. You know what? I'm going to raise my weekly contribution to $600 a week. And I was like, wow, man. I said, that's a lot. <laughs> I said, you don't make anywhere near that. He goes, oh, you know, I, I just, I'm glad for what God's doing. I believe in what God's doing. Now, this is also the guy that went across the country with, uh, I think he took $20 and came back with change riding a bike. Like he, he didn't spend it all. So he's a radical dude. <laughs> and, and I said, well, how'd you eat? He goes, you'd be amazed at what people throw away. I'm like, I don't even want to know. <laughs> but he started giving $600 a week and then he lost his job several months later. And I just say, hey man, I, 
you, I'm sure you're, you're going to cut back on, he says, no, nah, no, I'm going to keep giving it. I go, you know, I'm not a mathematician, but 600 weekly, you know, that pretty much will wipe it out in 12 months, you know. He says, oh, no, I, I just believe God. God is good. God knows what he's doing. He didn't get a job for that rest of that year. And he gave every dime away to the church. And as soon as he gave it all away, he got a job. So he got a job. And I was like, well, hey, man, you got a job. You were great. No, he says, man, this is, it's all God's anyway. I was like, amen. Several years later, he got another inheritance. This was more, 40, 50. And I said, hey, what are you going to do with that? So I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to keep giving. And he gave until it was gone. Again. Amen. I was like, dude, I saw him 20 years later. This is not a lie. I went up to him and said, hey, man. I said, remember when you did this inheritance stuff and da da Do you ever look at that and regret it? He goes, no, no. He said, guess what? I had a long lost uncle and left me even more money. <laughs> I was like, you got to be kidding. He goes, no, you, got, you won't believe it. He said, some of it is in this treasure box, and I don't even know what this stuff is worth. He says, but I got so much land now that I own, like acres and acres and acres of land. He says, it's all mine. And I go, how are you going to give that away? He goes, well, I think I'm going to keep this one. <laughs> That's faith. I wouldn't have done that. Now, I, I got a rational mind, right? <laughs> it's faith. Faith, wow. That's the kind of stuff you just go, I can't have you preach, man. You're going to ruin my church. You're going to make everybody feel guilty. <laughs> Wouldn't that be Jesus if he was with us? I got no place to live. I mean, that would convict all the ministers, right? I was like, well, I got a place to live. I got a nice place to live in. I mean, I, whoa, faith that challenges us. You know, I remember, um, <laughs> you know, Dave Mitchell, who's here. Uh, baptized Dave Mitchell when I was in college. Dave Mitchell's father, let's just say he owns a lot. Uh, very, very wealthy man. And Dave coming up as a Christian, you know, when he got out of school, I, surely I thought he wanted it. I said, I don't want that. I go, are you kidding me? Dude, just take it and hire somebody. He goes, I don't want him. I'm fired up about what I'm doing for the Lord. Faith. Faith, just great faith that challenges the core. We need to be around people like that. They also had a spirit of obedience. What is the spirit of obedience? It's the spirit of surrender. Elijah and Elijah were both obedient to God. They faced uh, many challenges. You're going to face many challenges. You got to be surrendered. You got to be surrendered about what your strengths and what your weaknesses are. I know for a daggone fact, I am terrible with millennials. I'm just terrible with you guys. Don't ask me why. No, I know why. Don't ask me why. I just got issues. And, and you know, and in our church, you know, we had a group of y'all. And I'm like, look at them. They're not happy. They don't like my, millennials don't like loud preachers. They don't, just so you know. If you ever preach in front of them, they're not into the loud folks. It's kind of like Germans. Germans don't want loud leaders. You know, leader, in, when translated in German, is a different word. You know, the Fuhrer. Like, they, they, it doesn't, you know, we have lead evangelists, you have the Fuhrer evangelists in Germany. No, that doesn't work in Germany. And for a lot of millennials, they don't like me. I'm loud, I'm crazy. What? You know, they like TED Talk stuff, deep stuff. I'm not deep. I'm not a liberal arts major. That's not me. And so I wind up offending a lot of times some of the younger generation. And whose fault is that? That's my fault. And so we had a bunch of them in our, in our region, in the region I was leading. I said, these guys are uninspired. And if I sit down and talk with them, they're going to tell me all the things I don't want to hear. You know, but you know what? They love God just like I do. Yes. And what they value is what I value. Yes. But we get there a different way. Amen. So I pulled them together. I said, you know what? Why don't we start your own region? People are like, dude, they're going to leave. They're going to go. No, they're not. They're going to think I'm the greatest thing since Captain Crunch. <laughs> Giving them the opportunity to shape the service the way they want it. 
to worship the way they want. They wear jeans and flip-flops. I'd never wear flip-flops and preach. I think that's a travesty before the Lord. They think it's awesome before the Lord. Khaki shorts and flip-flops, they do it all day. I see it, I'm like, ah! Sacrilege, drive them out of the kingdom of God. They wear baseball caps doing communion. I mean, ah! Their music, I don't know the words. They're singing stuff, holding their hands up. I don't know what they're doing. But evidently, it's inspiring them. I'm not going to condemn them. Amen? I know my, I had to surrender. You're not the man, Chip. You're just not it. You, you need to understand that some people, you're just not inspiring. And so I grabbed some other millennial leaders. I said, you lead them. Give them what they want. I said, but we have a benchmark. Jesus is Lord. We're on a worldwide mission. We're going to convert. I, don't, I care a lot about numbers, so I don't want to hear nothing about tell me you're driving my numbers. I don't care, but you better grow. Now, you figure out how you're going to grow, you grow. 41 people, two years later, that group grew to 70. They figured it out. You go to that service, totally different than mine, but they're having a great time. They're all engaged. Their faith, I had to surrender. You got to be willing to go, you know what? I'm just not that good. And let other people do it. My final point is spirit of courage. You know, the bottom line is people are not going to like you for good reasons and bad reasons. There are things in your character that are just terrible. They're weak, lousy. Nobody's writing a book about your bad character. They're just not. You, 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 and we have to accept that. I've got things in me that are just terrible. And I have to accept that. It, it, that takes a spirit of courage. The other side of it is there are people that are going to say things to you that are going to be very discouraging. And what are you going to do about it? Get mad? For what? I don't have time to waste what little bit of life I got left <laughs> getting upset about somebody's opinion of me. I'm just not wired that way. You, you know, people are going to have opinions. That doesn't mean I don't listen. I had to listen to the millennials. I had to hear what they were thinking. And God blessed it, and now they actually like me. Well, just the ones in my church. If there are any of you out there, please don't throw stones at me, because I can't move as fast as I used to. But when I was coming up, I still remember coming out of college, and I wanted to go into ministry so bad. And the guy that was overseeing the work, not where I was at, but overseeing his work, said, no, you too black. I'm too black. Like, is that a complexion issue or is that like a black people know what I'm talking about? <laughs> In other words, am I too dark <laughs> or do I need to be light skinned? Like too black? Like, what do you mean? He goes, you're just like the KKK. I'm like, I'm like the KKK. Wow. Like, and back then you could not defend yourself in any circumstance when someone makes an accusation about you that happened to be in the ministry or leadership. So I just said, okay. <laughs> and he said, no, I don't want you. Well, who do you want? I want the guy you've been raising up and trained to do what he's been doing. I Like, you mean the one that I taught how to be effective? Yeah. Okay. It's like, wow. At that time, I had rejected trying out for the NFL um, because I wanted to be a minister. In addition to rejecting that, I had rejected uh, my father's business where he said, I'll pay you $4,000 a week if you come home to Philadelphia and work for me. I said, no, I want to stay in New England because I want to train to be a minister. And now my hopes and dreams, you feel it. And you, and you can get discouraged. Yeah. You can get mad. Well, that guy's a racist and he's in authority. He should be kicked out of church. I'm like, why? I don't want him to go to hell. Why would I kick him out of the church? I want him to be redeemed. I want him to be forgiven by God. Forgiven by God doesn't mean you struggle with the same sin. What sin have you stopped so much that you never do again that you don't want to be forgiven of? Huh? Huh? I don't care. The guy got problems. Now, it finally got worked out. He got kicked out of ministry. I wasn't happy. 
I wasn't rejoicing. But 20 years later, come to find out, I saw him at a conference. He said, hey, I'm thinking of going back into ministry. What do you think? And I just looked at him. I started to say, you too white. <laughs> You're just way too white, man. You, you know, you, you like Farrakhan and his crew. <laughs> I did not do that. I did not do that. I told him, I said, go for it, man. I hope it works out for you. And another brother that I was close to that was with me in the campus ministry knew about that. He says, you didn't say anything? I said, for what? I I feel great about what God has done. Well, I'm going to say, well, you go right ahead. (laughs) I feel great. About what God has done. You can't let stuff like that happen. I still re- I felt looked over. That's okay. If God wants me there. Well who's going to stop me? If God wants me there. I still remember when I finally got in the ministry. And then my wife and I prayed. Not to be appointed evangelist and women's ministry leader. We did not want it. I said I don't want no daggone title. I don't need a title. I said honey we're going to pray. That we never get appointed. And we're just going to do what we get to do. And be happy. Well that weekend. Randy pulled me aside. We're going to appoint you guys. I'm like, doggone it, Lord. Don't you hear what I'm asking? I don't want to be appointed. Uh, And then uh, once I got appointed, a brother came up to me and said, uh, yes, Kurt, I saw you look at your watch. I'm getting ready to end. (laughs) That was the guy that told me I was too black. Oh, wait, he's not old enough. Okay. (laughs) It wasn't him. (laughs) And, and so I'm sitting there and I'm like, okay, so we get appointed. So then I get appointed and then another white evangelist came to me and said, you know the only reason why you got appointed? Because you're black. It's affirmative action. I said, if that's how God wants to use me, so be it. He's now out of the ministry too. I think the lesson is don't say bad things to Chip. You out of here, man. I don't know. But then last week, I'm at the International Leadership Conference. And, uh, and a brother came up to me. An African-American brother leads another church. He said, you know who you are? You ever see Django? I said, no, I didn't see it. My son told me it was a terrible movie. You Samuel Jackson. He showed me a, a picture. He called me a house Negro. What? That A black dude calling another black dude? Do you understand the anger that was about to bubble up in me? And I'm like, wait a second. I'm the one that got you your job. That's what I wanted to say, but I wasn't going to say that. I said, that's cool. I said, uh, if that's who I am, that's who I am. Because you don't like what I said about things that are going on in church. We have to be careful that we maintain in our large cities a diverse community. We cannot build black churches in all our major cities in America. We cannot. We have to be intentional and make sure we keep diversity. That we reflect the demographic. He didn't like when I said that. So he called me a house negro. And I go, that's cool. You know what I told him? I said, I tell you what, why don't you go back, look at the last year since you've been leading that church, all the baptisms you had, and tell me how many people are white that you converted. He goes, oh, I'll go look at the stats. You ain't got to look at no stats. You know. He waited a day. I said, said, did you look at it yet? He goes, no, I I didn't look at it yet. I'm like, okay, let me know, because I am going to call him. Sometimes you're going to rate real obstacles. Don't let it get you mad. Be happy. Be fired up. God will bless you. We're going to end here. This guy, uh, yeah, Flopsy. <laughs> he revolutionized high jumping. And he, uh, the, the Flopsy Flop, it's called, used to high jump, they would jump with their stomach facing down. And he realized that, nah, this is not the most effective. He worked at it, he worked at it, he worked at it. People said, you're crazy, stop doing this. This will never work. Until he broke the all-time record at University of Oregon. The whole world has been changed because he decided to work through it. We can change the world with God's Holy Spirit. Let's go do that. Thank you, guys. we got to end.